Uh, they're not allowed to mix with the other residents. They're not allowed to eat in the restaurant. They have to come in the back door, not allowed in the front door. They weren't allowed to sit in the garden. It was a lovely sunny day, and all the paying residents were in this garden, and the parent decided to bring the kids for a walk, and to go for a walk, they had to walk through the garden. And while walking through the garden, the, the seven-year-old boy saw a bowl on the, on the ground with water and says to his mammy, Mammy, why is the dog allowed in the garden and we are not? So your self-esteem hits rock bottom. Many homeless people, the depression would be a very common uh, uh, thing for. Uh, and if you go through the home, and I would like to mention the, the emergency homeless services are a total and utter disaster. Uh, if you want to get a bed for the night, you're going to, you make a phone call at 2 o'clock to the free phone number. If you ring that number at two minutes past two, you'll be told you're 50 second on the waiting list to speak to somebody. You could be on that phone for an hour and a half before you actually get to speak to somebody, and then you may very likely be told there's no beds left, ring back at half four and go through the whole thing again. Imagine doing that with a mental health problem. <laughs> it is, And then you're put into a hostel full of drug users. Biggest complaint I get from homeless people in the mornings is I was sharing a room with three or four others. I woke up this morning, the three or four others were gone, so was my money so are my runners, so is my mobile phone, so is anything else I have of value. There's a huge emphasis on having the right number of beds for homeless people to get them off the streets, but there's no discussion around the quality of those beds, and the vast majority of emergency beds are of such appalling quality that people feel safer sleeping on the streets. There are three groups who will not go into those uh, dormitory-type accommodation. One is people who are drug-free, are people who have come out of drug treatment, they're going to be put in a room sharing with active drug users. Two is young vulnerable people, and often young people coming out of care, they're terrified of going into those dormitories. Uh, and the third is homeless people who were abused as children, and they tell me they break out in sweats at the thought of sleeping in a dormitory full of strangers. And so the emergency, the quality of the emergency accommodation is absolutely appalling. If I could very quickly, the rent resettlement scheme, yeah, it has a place to play, but it can only, it will only deal with a tiny minority of families will want to move out of Dublin, uh, leave all the supports uh, structures they have. It, it has been an operation and quite successfully in many cases, and I think it could be well be uh, re reconstituted. The rent supplement. I don't. I'm not convinced by the argument. If you increase the rent supplement, the rents will simply go up. The alternative to giving to somebody on rent supplement is to give to somebody who's working. Our market forces come in here. There's a limit to what somebody who's working can afford to pay, and a limit to what somebody who's working is willing to pay. Uh, so I don't think the argument you increase the rent supplement, the rents will automatically go up. But in the answer to that is you introduce rent control. You introduce uh, legislation to uh, allow rents to increase in line with the consumer price index. I think that's a very fair solution, both to the landlord and to the tenant. And if you increase the rent supplement, uh, then you simply allow people who are on rent supplement to compete uh, with others who are working. Uh, the uh, the people who uh, who have separated, we came. Vast majority of those have no problems. They've separated from their partner and they're now homeless. We came across a 50-year-old sitting on a park bench. He had reared his children. He had his own home. He had worked all his life. He lost his job in the recession, uh, and he split up from his his partner. And he was sitting on a park bench at half ten at night. Uh, one and he got a he made a phone call to the free phone number, and they told him uh, there were no beds left. Come down and get a sleeping a sleeping bag. Now, he didn't have any addiction problems or alcohol problems or any other problems. It's just he didn't get on with the wife <laughs> at this stage in his in his life. Now in that case, uh, 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 a good. Samaritan and brought him into town and paid for him uh, to stay in a bed and breakfast uh, uh, for the night. So, and traveller accommodation. Finally, traveller accommodation during the recession has been reduced. Funding for traveller accommodation was reduced by 85%. And much of that wasn't even used by the local authorities. And funding for traveller education was reduced by 90% during the recession. And I find those two figures absolutely appalling. 
Mr Doyle, did you want to conclude yeah. on this? Uh, there, there are a series of other questions. Yeah, just so. two things to conclude on. One is in relation to the older uh, people as well, as, as Peter has mentioned. We have housed a number of lease, and they're exactly as Peter has said. They don't have any uh, um, major uh, stumbling blocks from living independently. They just need access to housing, and the housing force model is a very good model for that. Uh, they don't need a huge amount of wraparound supports. Uh, we housed a 60-year-old woman there recently whose uh, marriage uh, had broken up those uh, um, um, and the house was sold. She moved into private rented, but um, you know this small piece that she got from the sale of the house was supplementing the rent. She, she clearly was living in a rented property that she couldn't afford. As soon as the money ran out, she could no longer afford it. Became homeless. She was working, had a job, um, and, and we have housed her successfully. Um, she got a lot of assistance in the first week from us, but after that, now it's a phone call. She, we have a 24-hour number she can ring. She's living independently. So there's a whole cohort of people there, particularly of that age group where one keeps the property or the property is sold and, and stuff like that, that just need an initial support to get back into the in, into accommodation. And then finally in the resettlement scheme as well, we have housed, um, as Peter says, small as it may be, but we've housed two very, very successful cases of late, one in Cavan and one in Offaly, where um, uh, Two, two single homeless people who had met in, in, in accommodation, um, you know, but got on well, decided you know, that they wanted a fresh start and they'd be better off doing that outside the capital. And they're um, in third level in another tourist in Cavan now, um, Loud, I think somewhere around that area there, they're, they're doing a course and they're, they're getting on grand and a young couple in Offaly and they have absolutely said, and the big challenge for us now will be to make sure we get them employment and the employment is a big issue uh, um, in some towns, but that, that's the challenge. I think if we can get the employment issue for them, they will hold their accommodation and settle very well in Offaly. Thank you, Mr Doyle. I'll take the final series of questions. Um, Deputy Coppinger. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the committee and thank you for raising the issue of housing and, and radical measures as well. Um, in particular, I think Peter McVerry is associated with pointing out what was coming down the line. The tsunami of homelessness is kind of a, a phrase that resonates still. Um, I just Obviously, time is short, so a number of things. I wanted to start with the point that you make in your, in your submission. We have a housing system, not a housing market. Now, in the programme for government, uh, the aim of a government's housing policy is, quote, to create a functioning housing market. So... I have a problem with that, and I, I would like to hear your views on it, because you, you identified you have the same problem. Would you agree that the government's approach to solving the housing shortage, which they're still calling it, by the way, is to make housing supply profitable for either developers or landlords? Um, but by doing that, you're making it more expensive for first-time buyers, for families, and for people renting. So... The, the philosophy that the government has is, I think, a, a problem. Why do you think that the government... You, you point out about the private rented sector, three-quarters of the people on the housing list being accommodated that way. Why do you think that they're still pursuing that? Because <clears throat> even in the, the new housing figures, 75% will still be, unless there's a change following this committee, but will still be through the private rented sector. Um, isn't it logical, if your aim is to create a housing market, that you do that? Uh, do you think that the government and many in the Dáil have the same interests as those developers and landlords? Uh, there, there is a, an issue with 20% at least, we haven't heard the, the new figures of the new TDs, but about 20% of TDs are landlords as compared to 4% of the general population. So if you like, they're very overrepresented in the Dáil. But uh, just on compulsory purchase <coughs> orders, I'm, I'm really glad that you're raising this and that this is getting an echo. Um, and we don't have time to go into it, but we had two sessions here with Edmund Honan and Professor PJ Drudy as well. Now, Edmund Honan went in. There was 30 points in this submission, so I don't really see why we're lacking in legal advice. He went through all of the issues around public interest, common good, and the nub of it was this, in his view, uh, the Supreme Court generally considers something is constitutional. You know, they start with that premise. But that the whole issue of the common good has huge legal sway. Um, now, if 
the doll isn't satisfied, the doll can make clear that there's a fundamental you know, problem and it isn't the common good that there's housing supplied. You know, that, that there's ways that the, he went through this chapter and verse now Deputy Cowan is gone. But, you know, if, if, I suppose you'll get the legal advice that you want. That's, that seems to be the case, you know. You, you all, we all know you can get the legal advice you want. But you, you, you raise that you think that these should be CPOs of vacant properties, right? What sort of compensation do you think should be paid for that? Because if we pay the market rate for that, in some ways you're actually rewarding hoarding. You know, um, and uh, also just uh, the, the whole issue you raised of vulture funds. You call for legislation to prevent financial institutions and local authorities from evicting people into homelessness. Would you extend that to private landlords? Because the majority of people who are being evicted into homelessness right now, it is through private landlords. Um, using the, we have to sell the house, the granny has to move in, the sister, the, you know, there's a, all those issues. Um, because the RTB were in here as well and other agencies and overholding has increased by 50%. Evictions have gone up in the 2010 to 13 period by 137%. So we obviously need some law to protect people in the private rented sector as well. And I think it should, legislation should extend to those people too. Um, just on the <coughs> voids, the last quick few, how many do you think are left? Because you, you raised that there should be work done. But would you agree that the government have been using the voids to mask a lot of the work that they're doing? Because if you look at the figures, voids are included in the new housing. They're not new housing, they were there before. They were just not funded to be done up. Um, on the rent supplement, we had the department in here uh, on Tuesday. Um, and I raised the issue of why they've consistently recommended to the Minister, including last year, not to increase the rent supplement. Knowing full well, as you point out in your submission, it went down 27% when the rents have gone up a huge amount. Um, I think the department has a role in causing the homeless crisis. Um, and it would seem to me that the only rent controls in this country have been enforced on the backs of the poorest people. Um, lastly, on the mortgage to rent, I, I'm not as keen, I mean, I agree with the policy, absolutely, but can I put to you another option too? You, you're advocating that the approved housing body buys the mortgage, the state tops it up as it would with HAP or whatever. But should the state-owned banks like AIB and permanent TSB not be asked to write down mortgages? Because we're going to end up paying through the HAP anyway for a state subsidy of this scheme and more money could be released on that family you know to spend in the economy and it could help bring down the house prices as well thanks thank you deputy uh, deputy ryan uh, thanks chair and i'd like to thank uh, peter mcferry trust for coming in i think your contribution is very helpful to our work uh, recommendations are clear and concise of what we're looking for and they don't prompt too many questions for me but there's one area that kind of is of interest to me is in relation to your uh, for institutional discharges where you recommend that departments would uh, well discharging departments would take responsibility for programs and presumably accommodation needs as well are you aware of any international best practice in that area that we could look to as something that we could uh, maybe recommend as part of our uh, part of our work? Thank you, Deputy Ryan. Deputy Moran. Yeah, I'd just like to thank that it's a very detailed report. I think if we were to heed everything that's in the report, or to, 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 to make it work, it'd be great. A lot of people have great ideas. A lot of people blame governments. And today I listen an awful lot in relation to local authorities. But it's fair to say it's only a statement that. We as governments have left local authorities with no money for the last 10 years to develop housing. And in fairness to local authorities, they have done tremendous work over the years. And people can knock and blame local authorities, but if you starve the, the people who are driving the housing market to build houses uh, they can, and without money they can't build, and then they brought in the RAS scheme. And we all know the problems uh, that the RAS scheme brought in. But I really appreciate what you've done today, lads, and the work you've done and brought forward. And it, it, you don't get enough praise, enough thanks, and it is the funding is the big issue at all. But what you've done and brought to our light, uh, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.
that uh, concludes the questions. But just one final point, Mr Doyle. When you started your own presentation, you referred in one of your first replies to uh, a number of voids you brought back into use last year. I think you said maybe 39 or something like that. Would you just give us, as a committee, an overview how you identified them, how, what that process involved? Because it was innovative and it was to deal with a re it was a real solution to a real problem. Yeah, well, well, firstly, I, I should say, in relation to all of those voids, they were local authority voids, and um, I'm, I'm not sure um, if we... Uh, I just want to correct any, uh, a statement there, just in case there was any um, connection to us. We actually support the work of the local authorities. We work very well in partnership with the local authorities. I haven't found uh, a local authority, uh, a, a senior local authority official, where, at, at my level anyway, that wasn't dedicated to solving the housing crisis. Um, but you're right, resources, backing uh, is a big thing for the local authorities. Um, the 39 that we identified were all in Dublin, unfortunately. We did identify some in Limerick, because we operate in Limerick as well, um, and we haven't got them over the line yet. But in Dublin, um, take one, one complex, for example, in Hogan's Court, we would have had our own staff um, constantly, we're, we're constantly pulling in and taking photographs of buildings, uh, around, looking out every day, doing the scouting, and we would have approached our local authority colleagues, and the first one we did was in Pym Street. It was um, a, a local authority unit for 30 years. It had six units in it, three, uh, five two beds and one one bed. Um, they had handed it over to an approved housing body in the early 2000s. That housing body, approved housing body, uh, let the building go, in fact, and uh, there was a management issue with it and gave it back to the council. Um, there was one couple remaining in that building when it was handed back. All the rest of the units were boarded up. Uh, that was a very vulnerable couple. So we said, give the property to us, and we went out then and looked for a donor. We actually got a donor through a, um, a foundation. It was a building construction company who had a, a foundation that built housing mainly in Africa and Asia, had never done it in Ireland. Um, we were the first in the British Isles, actually, uh, anywhere to, to, to get the funding directed this way rather than they were kind of building what they do in Haiti, if you know what I'm saying. So we said, we made an application to them, they gave us 100,000 and we matched it with 24,000 of our own funding. And we renovated those units in about 22 weeks. Um, and we made a very good video of it, it's on our YouTube clip, you can see it. And out of those six units then, we put one housing force client in there, somebody straight from the streets. We took two young people from care who, uh, you know, were condemned into homeless services after they left care. Um, and then the remainder we took from the housing list, all agreed with the local authority, all were registered in the local authority. So we did it in partnership with them. So we see that as a real partnership with the local authority. They own the building. We don't need to own it. They've leased it to us. They haven't transferred it to us. I know uh, I'm on the housing SPC and quite a number of our colleagues in the councils there don't want to see the housing stock transferred to voluntary housing associations. I'm of the view that we don't need to own it. We have at least that was long enough to allow the funder to invest with us. Um, and we've given full-time tenancies to six people. We repeated that then, so I suppose the good practice, Chairman, and, and how quickly we turned that around, uh, uh, in, you know, increased the confidence in the local authority that we could provide. So I suppose the challenge for the, local, for the approved housing bodies is to prove that they can do things and do it well and do it quickly um, and cost efficiently. And then we identified another unit up in Hogan's Court, um, and uh, that's 11 units or 12, 12 units? 11. 11, 11 units, and we turned them around in 12 weeks, and we secured all the funding for that initiative from the Construction Federation. That was their social corporate responsibility for 2015, and we had, every, we, we had them open for Christmas. And then we've since taken another partnership on the voids was, um, well actually it's not, it wasn't a void, it was a call from government last year for public bodies to make good any properties they had that weren't used. And, um, we identified a unit, uh, eight units that the OPW had, in fact. They were compulsory purchased for an extension of the National Art Gallery. The capital funding collapsed uh, in the crisis, 
and they were sitting on these empty units for a number of years. We have taken them off them now for 10 years. Uh, we've refurbed them in conjunction with Dublin City Council and the housing agency. And we have eight homeless people in there now, uh, one of which is a lad straight from the street. He's the lad that I mentioned um, that said, you know, uh, uh, that he, he still couldn't believe that he was in housing. Uh, a number of them have come from care and the rest have come from the ho housing list who are homeless priority. Um, we will support, we will maintain the units, we will support the units, we will support the individuals in those units, making sure that they keep the tenancies. Going back then to, to what Deputy uh, um, Coppinger was saying, we don't support the eviction of anybody from any units. The Trust has a policy where we don't evict. Um, we've actually got that policy, uh, particularly in homeless services, uh, mentioned across all homeless providers now have bought into that in Dublin, that you, what you look for is resettlement rather than eviction. Sometimes people will have, you know, caused considerable annoyance considerable maybe threats or damage to other tenants that it, you know it's not feasible for them to stay in that particular location or everybody else around them might have to move out but what we're saying all the time it should be a rehouse a resettlement program rather than an eviction so we don't support eviction we have had um, some very difficult cases in the trust and we've never evicted anybody and as peter said that we're only dealing with a very small amount uh, 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 with a lot of complex needs, but the vast majority of housing providers, including voluntary housing associations, are dealing with the general public. There shouldn't be evictions, so we don't support the evictions. Um, there's different philosophies as to how we deal with the banks. Um, yes, we could go, what the deputy said there, and write down the, the loan. Why not? The other option is we could sell IAB, and, uh, and I'm not saying I support this, I'm just saying the different arguments out there, is sell IAB and we get 20 billion, and we could ring fence that 20 billion for housing. For housing are most vulnerable and are most marginalised. But I'm inclined to say, leave the people that are in there, um, write down the loans, the Ulster Bank loans, for example, they're going to write them down to a vulture fund anyway. So uh, um, we should keep people in the houses that they're in. Um, Peter, did you want to come in? Anything? Yeah, there's a, if I could take up a couple of just... The private landlords, I think the private landlords evicting into homelessness is, is quite a, a special situation. I think the last government did introduce legislation to prevent landlords using the excuse that they were selling the house. They have to now produce proof that they're selling the house or that their granny is going to move in uh, before they can evict. Uh, but I think the whole private rental sector needs to be re-regulated. Uh, I'm, I'm aware I'm not used to defending landlords, but I, I do know some landlords who would have great problem with a, with a tenant, maybe antisocial behaviour, the tenant hasn't paid the rent for 12 months, you can't expect them not to evict them into homelessness. So I think there needs to be a whole re-regulation which will protect the landlords as well as the tenants uh, before you could uh, bring in a blanket uh, ban on landlords evicting people into, into homelessness. In terms of the Department of Social Protection, they have argued that nobody has been uh, come homeless as a result of the failure to increase the rent supplement. I would say that is absolutely and totally untrue. Uh, there is a scheme, I know, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, family can go to threshold, they can apply, they may get it, they may not get it. But most of the families we deal with who were evicted for non-payment of rent never heard of threshold. They don't know about this system. Uh, they simply get a notice from the landlord, your rent's going up, they've no way of paying it, and they, they end up getting moved out. So I would guesstimate that at least 2,000 families have become homeless as a result of the failure of the Department of Social Protection to increase rent allowance over the last couple of, couple of years. Uh, uh, the leaving prison, uh, what do other jurisdictions do? I'm not sure, but uh, I know in England they do have uh, access to private rented accommodation for people who are leaving prison. We had one lad from Ireland, he was in prison in England, and he, he rang me up in November uh, to say that he was being discharged from prison next Next, uh, next February, they had already got his accommodation uh, organised. They were going to have two weeks uh, social welfare payments at the gate of the prison when he was leaving, and they had a place in a training course for him uh, when, he, when he left in, in, in February. If somebody is in our prison for 12 months, two years, God, we have, we have enough time to organise something. Here they're leaving, they don't even have a medical card. Uh, leaving our prisons here, uh, uh, and, and that's causing huge, huge problems. 
I would guesstimate, and I spend most of my weekends in the prisons, but I would guesstimate there are 40 to 50 people in prison who would be discharged in the morning if they had somewhere to go to. Either they're on bail, the reason they're in custody is because they don't have an address, or they're eligible for temporary release, but the reason they're not uh, getting temporary release is they have, no, they have no address. And we're keeping 40 to 50 people in prison at enormous expense because we have failed to provide. And the final thing I'd say is I believe we need to call a national emergency. This is an emergency, and the problem is this is a multi-agency, this requires a multi-agency response. The Minister for Housing is powerless, unless the Department of Finance, the Department of Social Protection, the Department of Health, the local authorities, NAMA, uh, the, the, and the approved housing bodies, uh, unless they all come up with a plan that they can buy into and support. Uh, then the Minister for Housing's hands are, are tied. So I think the only way that can happen is for the Taoiseach to call an emergency, which he would do if we had a foot and mouth disease in the morning, uh, get all the relevant bodies around the table and agree on a plan to which all of them must uh, adhere, and the Taoiseach would, uh, at weekly meetings, make sure that those uh, plans were being, were being implemented. Thank you, Father McFerry. Before I conclude, I'm going to be very tolerant. Uh, Deputy Durkin has a very brief point. Don't push it. I need to correct something. I need to correct something. I, I have the greatest respect for, for Deputy Coppinger and her ideology, incidentally. Uh, but I do not believe that we can solve the housing crisis with the dose of ideology. In fact, I remember the time, and many of us around the table remember the time when we were able to solve all these housing crises without any reference to radical. As, 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 as suggested by Deputy Coppinger. And I don't know how many people who, who, who are landlords in the Oireachtas. That's not my function, I'm, I'm not my business. In the well, it may well be, but I don't sniff around the oh, member's see. interest to, to any great extent because I look after my own interests well, as best I can, and I am not a landlord. But I do believe. You're listed I, as one. Well, I, well, if, I, well the, if I am, I'm incorrectly yeah, no, listed. No, I want to no, say no, that no, now. No, I want to no, say, no, I want to no, correct no, something there, Chairman. Hold on a second now. I want to correct that. I want to correct that. I want to correct that. I am not an landlord. And, 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 and that's suggesting, under, making that, a suggestion that that's is, is, is totally, totally incorrect, and it is wrong to try I'm, to create an impression that is incorrect anyway. So let, me, let me just finish you, now. No, Since the, well, the, the, the matter was raised, so I, I was wondering why it was raised. I afforded you an opportunity because so the, the, I, if you had a point, I, 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 I'm dealing with the point. I, I'm dealing it's with the point, Chairman. I'm dealing there, with the point. Can I, can, I, can I mention also? Can I, can I, can I mention also? Can, can I mention also that I, 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 I totally I agree. I totally agree with the, 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 the response from the, uh, Peter McVeary, Father Peter McVeary, and the Trust and the work that they have done. I totally agree with you. There's no doubt about it. But in effect, we are having a housing emergency, and the Taoiseach has indicated that we have a specified time within which to deal with it. The Taoiseach has indicated that he will drive it himself, uh, along with the Minister for the Environment and the other responsible yeah. bodies, the other constituent bodies. I think that's the I way that it I, should be. A, a so I, 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 I do not, I did not set out, I did not set out, Mr. Chairman, to create a political argument yeah. about this. But since somebody wants to put up the political argument, I'm up for it too. Yeah. Don't forget that. Look, look, please. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Deputy Wallace, you have a brief point, do you? Just a very brief, yeah. Just, just like to commend you on the wonderful work you're doing, and uh, I'm glad that you're making use of some units that I built in Russell Street. Uh, that, Deputy. Thank you very much. <laughs> They're fabulous units. Uh, Deputy Ryan, did you want to conclude? A brief point in relation to uh, Peter McFerry's. I'm actually, but anyway. Just a brief point in relation to Peter's comment no, about the. Workers, I think, built them. <laughs> oh, God, I help us. Okay. Brief point in relation to your comments, Peter, in relation to rent supplements and that driving people into homelessness. Just my own experience is a little bit different because what I'm finding is where rents are going up and, we, and people go to the community welfare officer, the flexibility is granted. Uh, inside or outside the threshold uh, kind of protocol. Uh, and, you know, it's, that, that's generally the case. And the other thing is the department, in fairness to them, we're, we're in the other day. And indicated that there were about eight thousand that they, you know, increased they granted beyond the caps. So it's not kind of a universal experience out there. Thank you. Okay. And ju just I want to make one one point, Father. You, you mentioned, you know, about um, landlords selling properties and notice being given. I fail to understand why notice would be given at all. If that was a commercial property, whatever the tenancy agreement was would reside with the property. 
So if there was a, you know, if there was a tenant in a commercial property and you were selling, the tenant goes and the tenancy goes with the property. I can't, I fail to understand every time a property goes for sale that it seems to have to be vacant. And what's putting a real pressure on it is when receivers are appointed, the very first thing they do is they clear the property rather than trying to sell it as a going concern with tenants and, and as a business. And you mightn't like it being described as a business, but I think it's appalling that the first thing you see when a receiver is the properties are detenanted. And if that was a commercial property, those tenancies would reside. And I, I fail to understand why that's not the, the, the normal been, practice. Yeah, the chair, Chairman, the Trust has been a victim of that as well, where we had properties on lease for year and, and they wanted vacant possession. So we, we fully, I mean, that's what we're saying about the, the, uh, the Ulster Bank loans at the moment. The, the Vulture Fund will want them empty and, uh, and we have an overcrowded ho um, hotel accommodation and very little private rent. Fully, I fully support that. In relation to, you're a fair, very fair chairman and you give everything, but if people come in here to score political points, that's what has us in the mess we're in today in relation to housing. Everyone's here with the best interests of the homelessness and the people that we're trying to help. So people shouldn't come in and it's betray it as a place to score political points. There is no room in this room for that. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Father McFerry, uh, Mr Doyle, unless there's anything further you want to say, uh, we're going to conclude this session. I'd like to thank uh, Mr Freel, Mr Doyle, uh, Mr Doherty and Father McFerry for uh, your submissions and, and your attendance and I suppose your direct and frank answers. Uh, it has been very helpful from the committee's point of view. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll adjourn uh, we'll till 2 o'clock.